Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to your friends. Oh, sorry about that. Let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. For a few moments... I want to preach from this perspective. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. That worry is a choice. And I believe God today is telling us that we do not have to worry. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you right now for the word of God that is going to go forth. Lord, uh, I just believe this is an on time. This is a relevant word for us here today. Let us be transformed and changed by the power of your word. As the grass withers and the flower may fade, we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I just ask you a simple question as I get ready to take my seat? (laughs) You don't have to worry. What are you worrying about right now? What is on your mind before you came to church? Right now, under the sound of my voice, what are you thinking about right now? What keeps you up at night? What are the things that are most anxious in your life? What are you worried about? right now. If we're honest, all of us are susceptible to worry. But if we look in Scripture, Jesus has something to say about it. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, I say to you, do not worry about your life. That is not a suggestion. That is a command that Jesus is telling us that we can live a life where we don't have to worry about our life. Now, when you read that or you hear that, you think that's negligent. We think that doesn't make sense, that we should worry about our life. But what I've discovered is there's a difference between being concerned and worrying. Being concerned means you care, so you're able to fix a problem. But when you're worried, you create more problems. I'm going to say that again. It's okay to be concerned. This week, there was a few things that happened, and I had concern, and since I had concern, my mind was on fixing a problem. But if I worried about the problem, then I'm going to live my life creating more problems. Do you know that 90% of the things that we worry about never happen? That, that, That oftentimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm riding in the car, I'm having invisible conversations about things that might happen. Our mind is consumed with things that never happen. Even in our marriages or with our friends and family, we start arguing about things that never happen. What about this? What if this happens? What if that happens? And Jesus today comes in the middle of that, and he says, do not worry about your life. (laughs) Don't worry about it. There are some things my kids do not have to worry about because they're in my house. When you are in the house of the Lord and you're connected to God, there are some things that you do not have to worry about if you're a child of God. Because when we worry about certain things, we are taking the place of our Heavenly Father. When we worry, what we're saying is, God, you take a seat. I need to get up and fix it because you're taking too long. In those moments, it's when we want to become our own God and we want to dictate how things are happening in our lives. And and, and there's moments I believe that God says, okay, you want to fix it? We'll see how that's working. Instead of saying, God, you know what? (laughs) Train me and teach me that I don't have to worry about living in this life. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, he, he pins this letter to the Philippian church. And he's talking to a group of people who are going through from through some devastating circumstances. Their money's a little funny. That they're having some uh, financial difficulties, but also they're having relational difficulties. They're having disunity in the church. They're going through heavy persecution, and as a result of that, Paul is telling them, "Do not worry." Now, Paul, maybe you can't relate to what I'm going through. But Paul is currently writing this letter on death row. He's writing this letter in prison with his life on the line, and he has the audacity to tell us 
not to worry. How come Paul, pretty much to the point where he can die at any moment, says that I'm not worried about a thing? You got to get to the place where you truly understand that God's got this. That no matter what happens, God has your best interests, according to his plan, in mind. And so he's writing to this church who's, who's struggling right now. They're following Jesus now, and, and maybe they've been taught some lies because things aren't going the way that they thought. And, and now Paul says, listen, I don't want you to worry about a thing. And so Paul says this, and he says in Philippians 4, before he talks about worry, listen, this is very important, before he talks about your anxiety, before he talks about worry, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, I have it in my notes right here. I said, Ken, they're not going to get excited right there because they're already thinking about what they're worrying about. They're thinking about their anxiety. But he says, here's the secret for us is to rejoice in the Lord always. Not sometimes, always. And we have to stop, including me, being conditional praisers. Instead of Praise is just what I do. What is a conditional praise? We praise God when things are going well in our lives. However, when things aren't going the way that we like, we stop praising God. In other words, we're not really praising God. We're praising our circumstance instead of praising God. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I don't know. I wasn't there when they were reading this letter. They probably was like, Paul, that don't make any sense. He says, again, I say, rejoice. Be joyful in every circumstance. Ken, what is the will of God? First Thessalonians tells us the will of God is to be thankful in all circumstances. No matter what you're facing, be thankful. What does the enemy want you to do? He wants you to stop being thankful. He wants you to start uh, looking at your problems instead of how far you came. <laughs> Some of us in here, you graduated high school, went through college, and you were probably making eight, ten dollars an hour. Now you're making some money, but you're mad that you're not getting the promotion. But you're not grateful for that God placed you in a job. We pray for God to put us in positions, then we get the position and get mad. <laughs> Instead of understanding that God puts us in positions to fix problems. How do you know you're in a situation that God opened up the door, that right when you walk in the door, there's a problem right on your desk? Why? Because he's called us to make an impact and a difference. And what I'm learning in, no matter what happens, we are called to rejoice in the Lord. He starts off before dealing with our issues and problems about anxiety to rejoice. James says it this way, consider it joy. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, for what? The testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so you'll be complete, not lacking anything. He says, before you go into the trial, do what? Consider it joy. Not being joyful that you're in the trial, but being joyful when you come out of the trial that it will mature you and make you better. It says to count it. That's an accounting term. In other words, and you understand this, when, when you're dealing uh, with money or you're trying to put money into your 401k, you don't rejoice. You don't get excited. Yeah, I'm putting money in my 401k. Yeah, I'm putting money in the stock market. The reason we do it is because we know it's going to yield dividends in the future. So the reason we can be joyful is because we know we're storing up money and it's going to pay dividends once we retire. It's the same thing in the kingdom of God. We can be joyful because if I'm facing a trial, I know when I come out of this trial, when I come out of this trial, in other words, I don't care what you're facing, you will come out of the trial, you can be joyful because it's going to mature you and develop you. And so the apostle Paul's writing to this church, and I believe he's telling us today that you got to rejoice always. See, the enemy does not want you to rejoice. See, we overcome by what? the blood of the lamb, and what? The word of our testimony. When we stop opening our mouth and rejoicing in the Lord and the enemy makes us silence, that is the place we never want to be in. And when we go there, we end up in isolation and we start worrying about everything. It says in verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord 
is at hand or the Lord is near. And right now, if you're watching the television, you're watching social media, everyone is screaming for what is right. Everyone's screaming at us, but the Lord is near and we need to rejoice in that. And so Paul says this in verse 6 in the circumference of our text. He says, be anxious for nothing. What would your life look like if you weren't anxious for nothing? Anxious simply means to be disturbed, to be pulled in different directions. And what happens when you're double-minded and you have the hope of God, but now over here you're dealing with your depression, your life is being pulled apart. And he says, we got to stop being anxious. We got to stop being worried for everything that we're going through. And he's about to give us the reason why. <laughs> because worry is the greatest thief of joy. If you find yourself worrying, at the same time, you cannot be joyful. If you're joyful, you won't worry. But if you worry, you won't be joyful. And so Paul is saying, you and I got a decision to make every time we wake out of the bed. You can be joyful today or you can worry today. But Jesus says, worrying does not add a single hour to your life. Worrying does not solve the problems. Worrying sometimes makes the problem even worse. And he says in Matthew chapter 6 in that passage, he says, man, God even takes care of the birds. You don't ever see a bird flying talking about, I'm worried. Man, that was my alarm system. Uh, uh, I thought that was a. You don't see them panicking, right? He says, I even take care of the birds. How come you don't think I'll take care of you? You're worrying because at the end of the day, if we're honest, we don't think God's got it. That's why we worry. When we stay up at night, what we're saying is, God, you must be sleeping. I need to fix it. But we serve a God that never sleeps nor slumber. So, in other words, the reason I can go to sleep, because I know even when I'm asleep, God is working things out. And at the end of the day, listen, if we're worrying, we got to be honest. That means, God, mm -mm, let me handle this situation. There are sometimes, man, my daughter, she, she... <laughs> She would tell me to help her out on the computer because she can't figure something out, and then I'm going to help her out on the computer, then she'll look at me and like, no, nah, Dad, I got it. No, you don't got it. That's why you asked me. She thinks she knows more than she actually knows. And that's what happens sometimes. We, we pray to God. We want something from God, but then we worry because we don't think God is on the job. And he says, don't be anxious for nothing. For nothing. What if you can live a life where you're not anxious for anything? What if you can live a life where you're not worried about anything? What are you worried about right now? That is an area that you and I are struggling to trust God in that area. And we have to stop letting our past disappointments and our experiences dictate the way we perceive God. Because what happens is other people have disappointed us. And what we do is we put that same frustration on God. In other words, if your father has disappointed you and if your father wasn't there, then what we do is we attribute those characteristics to our father that he might disappoint us, that he might never be there. It's quiet in this church. That's all right. <laughs> Don't be anxious for anything. But what about this? Anything. But what about this guy? Don't be anxious for nothing, not your calendar, not your children, nothing. You can live a life where you wake up in the morning. See, this is the thing. We can't think about doing things for God because we're so anxious about everything. Right? Yes, we're on our way to heaven, but I'm telling you, life is so much more than that. I don't know. I believe God is sharing with us right now that, and I've just been sensing this as we've been praying specifically on Saturday mornings, that a lot of us are living lives as defeated Christians. And I was thinking about this as I was praying this morning, and I was thinking about this analogy of the Olympics. Imagine 
an Olympian getting a reward, a gold medal with their head down in disappointment. You and I already have the victory. We're going to receive the crown of life. <laughs> but we're going around in disappointment. And I believe God is telling some of us today is lift your head up. You don't have to live a life dealing with anxiety and dealing with worry. Now, if you're in here, and, and, and maybe for you, worry and anxiety, and, and I really mean this, maybe you're dealing with some mental health issues. Like, I, I do believe God uses medication, so I'm not saying, like, like, something's wrong with you or something's wrong with us if we're worrying. But what, what Paul is talking about here, he's talking about God's supernatural power, that whatever you're focused on right now, if we take it to God, and I'm going to give you the formula in a minute, that God can give you peace that surpasses anything you might understand. And so he gives us the secrets today. He gives us the secret in having victory over worry. All through Scripture, there's promises, but those promises come with a premise. Those promises come with stipulations. So today, as we talk about how to receive victory over worry, there's three stipulations that we must consider. Here, here's the first stipulation. If we want victory over worry, here's the first thing, and it's so deep. This is deep right here. You got you to gotta pray right. <laughs> you got to pray right, which, which lends us to this idea that you can pray wrong. You and I have to learn to pray right. Be anxious for nothing. Here's the formula. Before we get to the that peace that surpasses all understanding. There's a formula here. You can't just jump over here, right? You playing Monopoly, if you're on Baltic Ave, you just can't go to Boardwalk. You got to walk through every single piece in order to get there. And I believe sometimes when we recite these scriptures and we say, God can give us the peace that surpasses all understanding, we shout about it. We don't understand that there's verses preceding that to get there. And the first thing is this. You got to pray right. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, in everything, there is nothing too small that God can't handle or that he doesn't want you to bring to him. Whatever is stressing you out, whatever is on your mind, whatever you're facing, whatever's keeping you up, come to him in prayer. Come to him in prayer. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 from the message translation, it says, Call to me and I will answer you. Think about this. I'm pretty sure there's people that call you and you see it and you don't answer them. I ain't got time for this. You send them right to voicemail or you wait. I got I to gotta let it wait. Three rings because I don't want them to. Anybody guilty of it? Right? God doesn't do that. God never puts you on call waiting. God never looks at the caller ID and says, I'm not feeling this person right now. God, when you call on him, before it even rings, he answers that phone because God gave you the desire to even pray. Call to me and I will answer you. <laughs> See, some of us in this room, I feel it right now. We don't believe that. I I've been calling on God. He's not answering me. The problem is when you hear his voice, you don't like the answer he gave you. Because sometimes when you call God, God will sometimes have you apologizing or doing something before he continues the conversation. Call to me and, and answer me, and I will tell you what, marvelous and wondrous things that you can never figure out on your own. There are some things that you and I are facing that in the natural, we will never figure it out. You can have a vision board night with your girls. You can stay up all night strategizing. You won't figure it out. But God already knows the answer. He says, call on me. I will answer you, and I will tell you these marvelous things. He's writing in Jeremiah to a group of people who are despaired. They know the promises of God, but yet they're about to go into captivity in this moment. For 70 years, he says, listen, it's not going to be your best, but, but just call on me and answer me, and I got great plans for you. So I don't know about you, but I had great plans, but, but when COVID happened in last year, anybody just felt like that was just a throwaway year? That was just, you just got through it. 
but man, you have plans, you have things that you wanted to accomplish, and you just walk through that year. I mean, that's how I feel. In my personal life, even in this ministry, I'm like, five years, I'm like, year four? We didn't even get a chance to celebrate or do anything, right? But he says, call on me and answer me. Then the New, uh, excuse me, the New Testament, Jesus in Matthew 13, he's talking in parables. He, he's talking to his disciples, but he's also talking to these Pharisees and other people around him. And when he gets done talking, his disciples say, Jesus, man, why are you always talking in parables? Why are you always talking in these cute stories? He says, because the knowledge of the secrets of kingdom of the kingdom has been given to you, not to them. In other words, he's saying there's some secrets that are just for you, and it's not for them. The secrets of God belong to the seeker. Listen to me. This is critical. Salvation is easy, but getting into God's kingdom, you have to seek him. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but first seek him, and all these things will be added to you. You are never, you are never going to walk into the promises of God just being a casual Christian. Just showing up to church and leaving out, and the next time we open up the Word of God is when Pastor Ken tells you to flip to Philippians. And I'm not condemning anybody. I want what's best for you. But being a casual Christian, it's cool. You're on your way to heaven, but you will never, ever live heaven on earth. When is the last time you prayed and you know it was God that did something? When is, the, when is the last time God really did something in your life that you couldn't do? Was it a week ago? Was it a month ago? A year? Do you have any God stories in your life? What is a God story? A God story is when, when you didn't know how something was going to work out. You prayed for it, and God answered your prayer. That's because you seeked him. And the reason sometimes God has to put us through tests Because that's the only time we seek him. See, how do you know you're really living this thing out? When your circumstances does not affect your prayer life. What I'm talking about is this. Now you're going through something financially or something in your health. Now you're like, man, I got to seek God. That should just be a rhythm of your life seeking God. That is why God allows suffering and trials sometimes (laughs) is so we can seek him. What is is a trial? A trial is when God gets on the bullhorn to get your attention. Instead of just saying, you know what, I'm going to seek him regardless of what's happening. Because you know what? When you seek him and you pray to God, before you get in a trial and you're already prayed up, you'll be firm in the trial. The problem is we go through trials and then what do we do? We try to get firm and built up. Listen to me, before you run a marathon, before you get in that line to run the 26 miles, I hope you were preparing for that marathon. Because you're going to feel good on mile one. How many more miles we go? 25. And you're not going to be able to make it. Why? So there's so many people. I, I love the Olympics. Why? Because for four years, you have these athletes training for a 10-second race. And you would think just because it's a 10-second race that I can take a day off. Uh-uh. Why? Because winners in a race only win by a tenth of a second. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that before we go through a trial, before we go through difficulties, we need to pray on the front end and pray right. And now he tells us how to pray right. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. Before you give your God Your Christmas list, it starts with Thanksgiving. Okay, you missed it. (laughs) Before you sit down, God, I want this, I want this, I want this. He's not Santa Claus. Thanksgiving is in November. December is Christmas. So that should help us out in our prayer life. Before I get to Christmas, let me start with Thanksgiving. I need to thank God. Why? I'm going to thank God before I even give my prayer. I'm thanking him because he's going to answer it before I give it. Why? Because I'm praying to God and God already gave me the desire to even pray it. That's why it doesn't make sense sometimes. We're like, if God already knows, why do I have to pray? So when you're praying for something, God gave you that desire to pray it. 
But he wants to know, do you have faith that I can do it? See, prayer isn't necessarily getting God to move. Prayer is getting us to move. <laughs> prayer is giving me faith to still believe. Prayer is building up my endurance. That's what prayer is. Because if you keep going through life without prayer, you're going to feel that you don't even have his presence. Now, you do have his presence, but have you ever felt distant? The reality is not that he left you, but you haven't communicated with him. It's like being in a house with your spouse sometimes. If we're being honest, you just feel like roommates. Why is that? Because oftentimes we didn't spend time communing with one another, communing with one another, being with one another, talking with one another. And when that happens, we find ourselves worrying. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is a devoted time of prayer. This is where you got to get if you're not there yet. You got to find a devoted time of prayer. You got to put your prayer time on the calendar. See, we put everything else on the calendar. And typically what we do is we, we put hobbies on the calendar, work on the calendar, all these other things on the calendar. And what happens to God is I just don't have time. Have you ever said this? I've said it too. You get to the end of the day, you said you was going to pray, and then you just run out of time. I ain't got time. No, we don't have the right priorities. We grown. We do what we want to do. And we keep outsourcing God. I'm talking about a prayer time. Now listen to me. Even today, this is a little bit strange. Today I got behind because things that happened on this weekend, I was praying on the car here. Normally in the morning, I'm spending time in a dedicated prayer time to God. But what we do is we kind of multitask God. So we get in our prayer time going to work. We get in our prayer time in the shower. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But do you have a time where you say, God, this is me and you, a devoted time. I'm shutting the door. That's why the Bible says to pray in the secret place. I'm drowning out everything else. There's nothing on my agenda. There's nothing on my calendar. My phone is set aside. My kids are set aside. It is me and you. That's a devoted prayer time. That's what prayer is. Can I submit that most of us don't have prayer we have what the Bible calls supplication. Let me teach this thing right quick. Prayer is a devoted time that you spend with God. Whether it's 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning, you do it at night, it is on your calendar. It's strategic. I'm praying. This is my time with God. You got to pray right. What supplication means, a problem happens in my life. Something jumps off in my life, and on the move, on the fly, I'm praying. That's supplication. See, we try to multitask God, but you cannot multifocus. What I'm saying is, come on, man, think about it from God's perspective. Think about it. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There was a time that I was talking to my wife, and she was just, she'll stop talking. Well, because I'm texting at the same time. So she was talking. I'm texting. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Babe, why you stop talking? Just looking at me. I want your attention. Does God have your attention? Come on, man. You're just playing me. You're going to work right now. You're hanging out. You're doing your thing. I know you're praying to me. I'm going to answer you. But when is the last time you drowned everything out and you prayed to God? Just me and you. See, when I pray, it is a business meeting. In other words, I'm here to handle business. I need things to get done. I'm not just, just praying just to check it off to make myself feel better as a Christian. I'm coming to handle business. And for, for some of us, listen, I want to encourage you. We've been the last four weeks praying here at 9 in the morning. It's a group of us. And you know what? When they pray, you know what it does to me? It encourages me to continue to pray. And I'm here to tell you that God has been doing some awesome things, and I want to submit to you. Why? Because this is what I know. We're coming seeking him. In other words, we're not coming to listen to a sermon. We're not coming to get a leadership meeting. We're not coming to get a prep talk. 9 a.m., we're coming to pray to God, the God who can do it, that we can't do it. How do you know what prayer is? Prayer is saying, I can't do it. God, you got to do it. That's what prayer is. 
So I'm getting up in the morning, 9 a.m. on Saturday, and I'm praying with a group of people. That's what prayer is. That, that's what it is. Ken, you want to go hoop at 9 a.m., you want to go golfing, I'm praying. It's on my calendar. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Ken, can we go out to breakfast? I'm busy. I'm praying. It's a business meeting. We wouldn't call off work. This is the work. And I'll be honest with you, there's been times in our ministry we prayed and we stopped it. You want to know why? It's because God told me, Ken, you need to stop delegating prayer. This is your ministry. In other words, before we get here on Sunday, we're praying for you on Saturday. And this is what I know. Some of us are not here because of worry right now. He says you got to pray and supplication with thanksgiving. Let what? Your requests be known to God. Let your requests be known to God. I don't know if you work at a business and you have the, the IT the IT team, and you got to submit a ticket. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You got problems? Okay. Now, you submitting the ticket lets somebody know that there's a problem that they can handle that you can't. That's why you submitted the ticket. Don't get mad at the IT person if you never submit the ticket. And a lot of us are looking at God, but you never submitted the ticket. You, you never came up here and said, God, listen to me. See, when I pray, this is critical. Because oftentimes, listen, if I got up here right now and said, hey, hey, sister, hey, brother, why don't you close out service in prayer? You know what some of us would do in that moment? Them eyes would get real big. <laughs> Pastor, you do it. As if my prayers are more effective than your prayers. All you have to do is say, in Jesus' name, because the authority and the power is not in Ken's name, it's in his name. See, when we say in Jesus' name, that is putting the stamp on the envelope. <laughs> you can try to submit a letter, but if you don't put a stamp on it, they're going to send it right back. So I'm here to tell you, when people say, my, my, my prayers are with you, are you going to say in Jesus' name? Because that prayer means nothing to me. It's in his name that means that when I pray, it goes all the way to heaven, and heaven responds, and it comes back to earth. <sighs> That's the type of prayer I'm talking about. That when I pray, heaven responds, and then it comes back to earth. And the manifestation of my prayer started with the desire that God has placed in my heart. That's me spending time in prayer. And watch this. Even if nothing changes the next day, this is what I know. I have a tendency to change in the process. He says, don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication Make your requests known to God. Now that we've done that, now that we're not anxious for everything because we rejoice, because we're grateful people, now that we know God's got this, and, and now that we prayed about it, which means I, I pray about it so I'm no longer going to concern myself with it, I'm no longer going to worry about it, with thanksgiving, with supplications, there's issues throughout the day that go on that I just need to pray and get it off my task list. Now that all that has happened, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. See, the issue is we're trying to understand certain things. We're trying to figure it out. God, I don't understand it good. Because what I'm trying to do is give you the peace of God which surpasses that understanding. In other words, this is understanding. He's trying to get you in your spirit realm to stop thinking about understanding and just pass it. I don't have to understand how God's going to work it out. I don't have to understand when it's going to happen. That is what God is saying. Listen, I don't need to pray for understanding. This is something supernatural. This is what I'm talking about. He says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, what will it do? It will guard your heart and mind. Paul is writing this letter while he's in prison. And when he uses the word guard, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just a nosy guy who looks in the Bible. It's the same word as a Roman military guard. The same guard 
that is protecting Paul. So I don't know if he was looking and saying, well, guard your hearts and minds. In other words, the same way this Roman military guard is guarding me in prison right now is the same way that the peace of God can guard you no matter what circumstance you face. And what is he saying? I want to guard your heart and mind. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm not here to scare you. I'm just here to prepare you because I know where we're going right here. So for me, we don't just come here and put together cute sermon series. I I pray about this thing. Now, I'm about to give it to you right here because we are shouting for joy. This is what's going to happen when it came to the mystery of marriage. I said in every message, I said, Paul talks about marriage, then he talks about what? Spiritual warfare. Pastor, that was a good message. You better prepare yourself. Now, I'm going to say it because some of us, you're probably feeling, you're going to go through persecution and spiritual warfare right now. Listen to me. I don't want that to scare you. I'm here to prepare you. (laughs) And what Paul is saying, what is spiritual warfare? It's when the enemy starts to get in your mind and tells you lies. See, he is a liar. He couldn't tell you the truth if he wanted. And what happens when you start to meditate on those lies, you start to believe it. And that is when we look at the word of God and we start to question it. It's because we put our hope and trust in what the enemy's telling us. And he says, listen, this is why I need you to pray and get peace that surpasses all understanding because the peace of God will what? will guard your mind. When the enemy starts to get in your mind, it's because you probably let your guard down. That's why he says in Proverbs chapter 4, he says what? Help a brother out, I just forgot. Come on, Marlon, you know more scripture than me. Guard your heart and mind, because the issues of life flow through it. The word heart in the Bible isn't necessarily the thing that's pumping The word heart is the control center of life. It is your mind, will, and emotions. He's saying, I need you to guard that. As a man thinketh, so he is. You can think yourself into depression. You can think yourself into bad things. No, that's why in Philippians 2, come here, let's read the Bible. Philippians 2, he says, have the same mind as Christ. Have his mind. You got to guard your mind. You got to guard what, this is old school. You got to guard what you watch. You got to guard what you listen to. Pastor, is it sin? I'm not talking about sin right now. You need to guard it. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it, man. I'm I'm just chilling with my kids. The new Cinderella's coming on, and I don't know if anybody saw it. But the fairy godmother comes down, and it's a dude. Nah, we guarding that. We guarding that. I'm not condemning anybody. You can watch it, but come on, this is your... Godmother right here, dude in a dress. As for me and my house, I'm sorry. Hey, I'll take you to the Cinderella play. I know this is old school. Why, I'm guarding my son and daughter's mind. Because the enemy's not playing. We too passive. (laughs) I was listening to one of my friends preach, man. I about shouted from the computer. He was saying, you know, everyone comes up to him after service and says, Pastor, do, should we force our kids to go to church? And he said, do you force your kids uh, to brush their teeth? Do you force your kids to take a bath? Even though they don't want to. But when it comes to church, nah, I ain't going to force them. But you know what the enemy's doing? He's forcing his way and his will on our kids. I mean, he's doing it. He don't ever ask the question, should I do this? Should... He don't ever ask for permission. We give him permission. We got to guard our minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. See, when we worry, we believe more in our problems than in God's promises. So not only if we want to have victory over worry, not only, number one, we got to learn to pray right, we got to learn to think right. We got to learn to think right. Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. As I was just reading this, it says, 
whatever things are of good report. I think it's Numbers 13. God has a promise for the children of Israel, and he, and he tells uh, 12 spies to go out. And 10 of them go out. He already said, this is your land. Just go and give me a good report. And when they go out to give Moses a report, what do they say? There's giants in the land. And Moses is like, I, I didn't ask. Give me a good report. You guys came back with a bad report. And only the two people who actually believed God entered into the promised land. Why? Because they believed what God said despite their circumstances. Listen to me. Do you give a good report or a bad report to your mind? When you lay down at night, was it a good report? Or what it was, a bad report. He says, think on these things. Think on the things that are good. Think on the things that are praiseworthy. It does not mean that you didn't go through life. It does not mean that you didn't go through difficulty. He's saying, but I want you to think on these things. Which means you and I have an option on what we think about. Think on these things. Then he says this, meditate on these things. You got to meditate on the goodness of God. You got to meditate on good things. I was thinking about this this morning. It says, Jesus makes this statement. He says, give us our daily bread, right? And in the Old Testament, he tells the children of Israel, he says, okay, you guys are complaining. I'm going to bless you with bread. But this is what he says. He says, the bread is just good enough for today. Daily bread. Bread means provision. That's why people, when they look at cash, they call it bread. This is the breadwinner of our household. Daily bread. And you know what they would try to do? They would take that bread. I'm just going to hold on to it until tomorrow. And then tomorrow, something that was so sweet had maggots on it, flies on it. Listen to me. And some of us, that's what we do with the word of God. You might even be here and listen to this sermon, and you think that's going to sustain you for the rest of the month, and it might, but you got to get in God's word daily. His mercies are new every morning, daily. I can't ever get to the point in my life where I think that I got it. When I get in the word, it's a reminder that I don't got it. It's a reminder that I need God. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm coming to God saying, today you got to order my steps. There's this old Baptist pastor that before he goes to sleep, he puts his shoes underneath the bed so he starts out the day in the morning on his knees as a reminder that my day starts with you. And what we do is before we go to bed, we're on Facebook, we're looking at the latest COVID statistics, and that's, that's damaging your mind. You wake up, you're so fearful. Instead of drowning everything out, and listening to his word and what God has to say. I think we had enough during the uh, political season listening to other people. I, I think we had enough. And, and no, listen to me, CNN, Fox News, nobody has the answers. But God has the answers. And God will sustain you no matter what you're facing. But you have to think on good things. You got to meditate it. See, we think meditation is about yoga. No, this is God's word. Meditate is started with the word of God. Pastor, can you meditate? I meditate every day and get in God's word. Well, I can't do that. But we in yoga classes and 120 degrees doing this for an hour. Can't say amen, say out. Oh, I can't meditate. My mind be drifted. But we be mm, for an hour and a half, hot coals on our feet, 195 degrees. Talk to me, somebody. I'm being honest. It's a priority thing. We need to meditate on the word of God. So how do you have victory over your worry? You got to learn to pray right. You got to learn to think right. And lastly, you and I, we got to learn to live right. We got to learn to live right because this is what I know. You can't just pray a cute prayer and then get off your knees and go back out and just live a reckless life. See, some of us are praying for stuff right here. You're not living right. We're not living right. I'm not talking about this holy perfection. I'm talking about getting in God's face, not just praying for my list. God, what do you want me to do today? God, what do I need to change? God, is there sin in my life? 
here's the dangerous prayer that sometimes I don't like to pray. God, search my heart today. And I'm not moving until you tell me what's wrong with me. Because oftentimes prayer is about what somebody else is not doing. God, do this. God, do that. God, do this. What God wants to do, he wants to do something in you. He's trying to prepare you so you can ultimately walk into the destiny that he has for you. He says in Philippians 4, 9, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the peace of God will be with you. You know what I've learned? I've learned that people may come, people may go, but the word of God says, live peaceable with all men. Live peaceable with all men. Even if somebody disappoints you and leaves, just, just bless them. Just honor them. Just pray for them so your conscience can be clear. Because I'm not letting bitterness or anything get in between my relationship with God. If I can be fully transparent with you, I, this week I, I studied for about 20 hours, had a, had a good message this week planned, and, and as I'm in prayer on Saturday, I'm just praying, and I wasn't even thinking about it. You know, God is like, Ken, you really going to preach that? I'm like, what? He's like, That's, that, you, you put that together. That, that was cute. You, you put that together. It sounds good, but that's not the word I have for you right now. So on Saturday, I'm like, now if you know me, it's like I'm already in 2023. I already know what we're preaching five years from now. I know your whole life right now. Where are we going? Y'all think I'm, okay. I know where we're going. I'm like, God, are you serious? And so it was this morning I had to, like, wake up. Like, God, what am, I, what am I doing? What am I preaching? Where am I at? But this is what I know, though. Listen to me. I struggle like everybody else. But I get in God's presence every day. So the word is already in you. I don't just want you to preach a word. I want you to preach. This is what people call a rhema word. Where that, that word is specific that people need to hear. Why? Because there's so many people, I already know who I'm preaching to, that are depressed right now. There's so many people that are heavy right now and dealing with burdens right now. And I could have preached about something over there and just missed everybody else. But no, he's telling us at Crossover Church, the people who are here right now, watching online, so many of us are worrying. We're worrying. And he says, that's not adding anything to your life. But Ken, I want you to tell them this. They got to learn to pray right. <laughs> they got to learn not just to have supplication, not just to pray on the whim when things happen. And I want to encourage you this week, put it on your calendar. If it's in the morning, if it's in the evening, whatever, this is the time, God. I'm not talking about two hours. I'm talking about for the next 10, 15 minutes. This is your time. I'm going to learn to pray right now. And then I'm going to have Thanksgiving before Christmas. <laughs> I'm going to start thanking God for what he's done in the past. You know what Thanksgiving does? It builds you up. It encourages you that you can continue to go on. There's an app that I use called Penzu, and it's a journal app. And, and I write down my thoughts, and, and every time a year later, it emails me. And it tells me what I was thinking. And I'm like, man, if I made it through that, I can make it through this. When the children of Israel, they would, they would cross over to the promised land or the Jordan River, what did they do? They put down stones on the ground. Why? Because when they would pass over the stones again, someone would ask, why are these stones here? Let me tell you about a time when God did this. What do you have in your house? What do you have as a reminder of God's faithfulness. And we got to think right. We got to think right. I want to encourage you this week. I've, I've said it a lot, but scriptures before screens. What does that mean? Before you wake up in the morning, you get on Facebook and check your email. I don't know about you. You check your email, then already you're getting anxiety before you get out of bed of all the tasks. <laughs> all the tasks you got to complete before you even get out of bed. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, I'm, I'm getting in God's face. I'm starting with him. I'm starting with him. I got to think right. Before I go to bed, I'm going to get in God's word. Listen to me. You cannot live your Christian life off memes on Facebook. 
I love the YouVersion Bible app, but that one little scripture that you post online, that's not enough for you. I'm talking about getting in God's word, meditating on it, picking this word up. And for some of us, we need to get a Bible. We need to get a because what happens is you start getting on your phone, notifications. I need to get a Bible. We got all these Bibles in our houses, but we don't even know how to use them. It says rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to meditate on that. Rejoice in the Lord always. God, I thank you right now. Everybody stand up. I feel the spirit of God right now. I, I just want you to stop thinking about your problems right now. And if you would learn to rejoice right now. I promise you that before you leave, the spirit of heaviness will leave off you right now. How about you just thank God right now? Let's just pray that God will give us the peace that surpasses all understanding.